pleasure pleasure to have you on mate um i've been looking into the macari foundation um and the work that you do um and i think it's fantastic um the way that you're helping the homeless yeah in, in quite a, a, way, a different way um i've seen that the pods that you do um if you want to just give a bit of background into the foundation um how it started um and what kind of work that you do um we started four years ago um we had a very small unit that we operated from it really wasn't uh, ideal for the numbers we had which was round about so we started with 10 that went up to about 18 went up to about 26 36 and then uh, i think we had as many as 40 in this quite uh, packed uh, unit we had so when this virus came along we had to get out government rules social distancing and we had to get out quickly and find somewhere i came and found a warehouse in the almost in the middle of stoke on trent a huge big place size of a football field and um thought how could i use this or could i use it and then um with the help of some pods that i seen in a field to start with um glamping it was called, i think it's glamping yeah yeah um thought they could be of use to me i made some inquiries about the pods themselves and then eventually purchased the pods and realized that um for the first time in probably most of our uh, guests that we had they had a an address to identify themselves with they could go to the job center now and gave the address in regent road and the, the number of a pod and also took a great deal of pride in that uh, pod that they've got which is their own they've got heating in the pod they've got a television and, and i did find the television being the biggest asset and of course it's only when you realize that homeless people who have been homeless for a number of years have never had televisions going about the streets and wherever they would go to at night uh, when i realized that i realized that uh, i'd sort of stumbled onto something that was probably more useful to them than anything they've had in their life before, which is being able to watch what's happening in the rest of the world, being able to keep in touch with everyday events. And of course, the rest of the television was now following some programs that they, they would get used to and following their favourite football team, which was always a, a bit of a problem in here when 40 odd people on a Saturday especially had one remote control. They'd be fighting over that remote control to watch oh, yeah. their team. <laughs> of course, the teams varied from Manchester United to Stoke City to Port Vale to yeah. Man City to Liverpool. Um, so the televisions that we've put in the pods have been our, our biggest asset in trying to help and change the the way of life. I agree. I think I, um, I had a look at on the foundation's website, and I had I, I saw a few videos of yourself explaining the pods, and um, I agree that that's one of the biggest. Um, advantages to what you're doing giving them um kind of just even the number obviously with universal credit it's a technicality where they're able to you know benefit yeah. from the system um and then also like emotionally they're able to have their own you know build their own interests up again and stuff like that um yeah. starting bo blocks to build in their lives back up again um is this uh is this a unique thing across the country these pods i think uh... I would think we're the first probably to put them in yeah. into a big warehouse like this. We've got yeah. we've got 46 pods at the moment. I'll probably be getting some more. Um and it's and it's been a massive help because when I started off four years ago, I only started off to do what I thought I could do, because I don't think I'm a magician by any means. And I thought, well, what what can I do? And I thought I can feed them, I can clothe them, and I can put a roof over their head. Anything else regarding homeless people and drugs and alcohol, I, I don't believe that uh, I can make that big, big difference in their lives. I'd love to. I'd love to be able to have some way of saying to them, now this is a road to uh, to nowhere, stop it now if you can. And of course, the majority can't stop it, which I've learned since I've been looking after people. Um, but any progress um i've realized as well any progress is progress it's progress they weren't making uh before because of a, 
they were stuck in their way of life, which is drugs, drugs, and more drugs. Yeah. Um, so I started off doing with them doing things that probably they hadn't done before. I'd take them on days out to places like Blackpool and that, and I took the view that not many will have been to Blackpool. Um, when I got on that bus to take them there, I realised that they hadn't because they were talking about they'd just seen a tower, which is obviously Blackpool Tower. And yeah. just, they, when we got onto the promenade, they were talking about there's a beach there, there's water. Which I've you know, never seen that before. Never seen it before, never been there before. Bought them tickets for the Pleasure Beach, which um, when I bought the tickets, the schools were were still at school at the time. So they had a whole Pleasure Beach to themselves. There was no school children there. That was another part of the day out they'd never experienced before because I'm just trying to slowly and gradually try and get them out of the, the routine of buying drugs. That's the daily, that's the daily routine, that's the daily habit. And of course, it's a crap habit, it's a crap routine. As you um, said, there's nothing else to do. So if you're if you're kind of um giving them the opportunities to do these things, it could gradually change their their ways, maybe hopefully. Hopefully. I can't think of any other things that I can do that'll that'll um that'll help them change their ways, yeah. except doing things that they've never done before and um so we look for a gradual change we see some gradual changes but we don't see the biggest change of all which is people coming to you on a regular basis and saying that's it i've had enough of this rubbish i've stopped it so now i i don't really expect that to happen but gradually if we can help them cut down on the, their alcohol intake the drug intake that's a start and Lou, you mentioned um, a few minutes ago that you're not a magician. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of Man United fans that would uh, disagree with that. So we're here to talk about um, the Macari Foundation and the work that they do. Um, but I'm sure that there'd be a lot of people watching that don't um, probably know your past. Um, and I suppose the Macari Foundation um, is... Uh, this probably obviously the second part of your life um yeah. the first part was extraordinary um so if you want to if you can for us run it back briefly just to edinburgh where you were born and, yeah. and um, the, the Academy as well because i think they were the quality street gang and yeah celtic supporter traveled on the supporters bus on a saturday to watch them uh to watch them at a the time they weren't very good didn't yeah. win anything probably not no, no, they didn't. I've only ever known them as being the best in Scotland, them and Rangers. No, back in the late sixties, they were second best all the time to Rangers. Oh, okay. And then, and then a miracle worker did appear called Jock yeah. Steen, who um, I'm very fortunate that for six years I was under his, I was under his guidance. He educated me to what he wanted and what he expected from me. Uh, and what I did have to do to become a footballer. And with Kenny Dalgleish there and yeah. uh, a lot of other players, um, we were under the, the discipline of a very strict disciplinarian. Yeah. To do what he said, or oh, you're out the door, you were gone. There was no messing around. And of course, I think all of us that worked under him realised later in life, in our football career certainly, that um, what how he brought us into the game and how, what he taught us was priceless. It was uh, money couldn't buy that uh, that education from a top manager uh, because at the time Celtics uh, Celtics performances under him changed. They were winning everything. Of course, I don't probably don't need to tell you. First British side to go and win the European Cup under his guidance. Uh, went to Lisbon and and uh, won the cup there and played great on the night. Uh, it was a night and a, and a time that Celtic supporters. We'll never ever forget. Um, and he brought along, he built a team that went to win that European Cup with no money. I think the total amount of money he had was thirty thousand pound for the whole wow. team. Managed to get them together, managed to train them. He didn't mess about with them. If you did, he'd let you know in no uncertain terms, unacceptable. So I, I had the, the great fortune to be working under somebody who employed Sir Alex Ferguson to work under him because okay, really? 
Yeah, when he was a manager, uh, when Jock's team was a manager at Scotland, Sir Alex Ferguson was Jock's number two. Um, that makes sense, because I was about to actually say, it sounds like a Ferguson-type manager, the way that he, um, he was. He, he, he is, he was, and he always will be, because when Sir Alex came to Old Trafford, and I used to go down to the training ground quite regular, out on the training ground, I saw Sir Alex, but I saw Jock Steen. I saw Jock Steen in that training ground, bowling and shouting. Um, so making sure Jock was young... his mentor? Jock was Ferguson's mentor then? Exactly. Exactly, together with Scotland, and they, 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 they sounded the same. It was the same messages I heard coming out of Alex's mouth that I heard years ago coming out of Jock Steen's mouth. Yeah. And of course, he, he did the same. You mentioned it, the Quality Street Gang, which yeah. we were known as as youngsters. Um, he produced, Sir Alex produced the class of 92, the exact same as the Quality Street Gang, just different names. But the same end product. That, that's fascinating because for my era, um, Alex Ferguson seems like one of a one of a kind. But there's always it seems like there's always a mentor that comes before, um, yeah. and people younger people wouldn't know about Jock. So no, he was the mentor, and you're right about Sir Alex. We, we all know about him. Uh, Manchester United's greatest ever manager will be manager will be Manchester United's greatest manager even years from now. Jock Steen, Celtic's greatest ever manager, will always be, no matter what happens in years uh, as we progress in life. And the two of them have got the identical um, DNA that um, that goes with, with great managers. So there's, the, there's your links that I've just filled in for you. Um, and as I say, Sir Alex comes to Old Trafford doesn't happen right away, same as Jock Steen, didn't happen right away with Celtic, but when it did happen, it happened in a way at Old Trafford that, that people will never ever forget, and they should never forget them. Same with Jock Steen, without a question, Celtic's greatest ever manager. And how many uh, times did you play for Celtic then? I played, um, in, in the time I was there, I played, uh, I think it was 130 odd appearances. Um, and was the move to United, uh, I, I heard a little story, um, I, you, can, you can tell me if it's correct or not, but uh, were you at a Liverpool game and then at half-time, Tommy Doherty uh, signed you up for United, is that correct or is that just... That, is, that is correct, but just to fill you in before that, um, I would never have left Celtic, I had no intention of leaving Celtic, they were my yeah. boyhood, boyhood team, um, but I'd lost my father, I was supporting my mother as well as my wife and... Uh, I had a family on its on the way as well. So the money I was getting at Celtic, I was on, I started on £50 a week. Then after playing for them for about four years, I uh, ended up being offered £55 a week. So it's not much of a rise. It's not going to look after my mum and it's not going to look after my family. So I said to Jock Steen, I'd have, to, I'd have to move on to to England, I think, because if, if you can't pay me better than a fiver increase, which is pretty pathetic, but they had the wage structure they told me. And um, I just decided I'd have to move on. Moved on, um, didn't know where I was going. Didn't know that Jock Steen's best friend was Bill Shankly. Didn't know that Bill Shankly had said to Jock a couple of years earlier, if ever I was to leave, he wanted me at Liverpool. Yeah. So I was smuggled down to Liverpool in a car. Mm -hmm. uh, Got into the ground. They were playing. They were playing Burnley that night in an FA Cup replay. And um, Bill Shankly met me before the game and said, "Look, I want to sign you. I want to bring you into the club. I want to put you in the team." Said all the right things to me. And there was no reason why I wasn't going to sign for Liverpool because the fact that Bill Shankly, another great manager, wanted me. I was I was chuffed about it. I thought. Then I watched Liverpool play. I couldn't understand why Bill Shankly needed me. Couldn't understand why he wanted me because they were they were an unbelievable team conquering all before them, best team in England at the time. Yeah. And, um, sat in the stand and in, in the uh, director's box, Pat Creran, who was number two at Old Trafford, come in, ex Celtic player, and uh, said to me, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "I'm signing for Liverpool." Told me not to sign because Manchester United will sign me. And now I had. Um, England's best team at the time and probably England's biggest team at the time. Yeah. 
and it gave it put me in a put me in a spot really. I spent ninety minutes, probably the most uncomfortable ninety minutes I've ever spent watching a football match. I'm probably more worried about how I was going to go and tell um, Bill Shankly that I wasn't going to sign because yeah, I wouldn't be want to be that man. Uh, it was Manchester United. I wanted to go to Manchester United, even though they were struggling, even though the the three big names, which were real big names to me, George Best, Sir Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law. Yeah. Those names were still at Old Trafford. They were still playing. And I wanted to be part of them. I wanted to train with them. And um, little was it to under, to know that quickly they were going to leave Old Trafford, or they did leave Old Trafford. But my mind made up it was it was Old Trafford for me. wasn't interested what the difference in money was yeah. because I knew... I was offered 180 pound by Bill Shankly. I knew the uh, I knew the money at Manchester United would be the same because back then most players' money uh, payday was the same. You got round about X amount, whatever you went. Unlike nowadays, where the players sell themselves to the the biggest offer. Uh, I just wanted to go to Manchester United. You went on to score. Was it 91 goals? I scored 99 in my 401 appearances. The 401 appearances was over 11 years. Again, a bit like Celtic. Um, I didn't want to leave. This was different, though. Um, my time was up. Um, yeah. Managers controlling you whether whether you stay or go. And Big Ron was manager at the time. Very fortunate to manage under Big Ron, or to play under Big Ron, rather. Very fortunate to play under Dave Sexton. And very fortunate to play under the manager who just recently has passed away, Tommy Doherty. Yeah, um, that's the name of my uh, granddad, just by chance, Tommy Doherty. Right. Um, but yeah, all fantastic managers, all, all brilliant players that you named as well. Um, how long were you at Man United before George Best left? Uh, I was there about, with Best Law and Charlton, I was there about nine months, probably ten months and, and a year. Get, with you get to know them much in that time? Did you? Sorry, did I? Did you get to know them much in that time? Yeah, yeah. time? Well, with any football team, you're in that dressing room, you're travelling away to away games, staying in hotels, so you get to know them pretty quickly because you've got to, and you get to know. And in, in the case of the, the the three people I'm talking about, got to know how not just great players they were, but great people. They realised their time was coming to an end. They realised that there was a, maybe a younger brigade coming along, which happens in football. And all I did get from the three of them was support, great support, um, an insight to the club, which helps as well, an insight to, to being a professional footballer, an insight to being a good person. And all three, even George Best, and I know what people think of George. George was a nice guy. George's problem started probably the time I came to Old Trafford towards the end of his career, when probably for the first time in his career, the alcohol was taken over. Yeah, well, um, I think you can relate that back to, to the work that you do now. You see it with Gascoigne, you saw it with Best. When yeah. uh, when the, that, when that they get to the end of the career and they, they can no longer um, do what they love to do, then the alcohol comes in and it's kind of related back to what you're trying to help <laughs> these people with now that, just to fill that void and fill it with some other passion other than, other than a destructive. Yeah, which is, you're spot on there. That's that's exactly what happens, and that's exactly what happened with George. Um, it's happened with Kenny Sanson at Arsenal. You know, he's been the England fullback, he's been the Arsenal fullback, he's been an ever-present. And then I, I got a call not so long, well, I got a call about a year ago to say, could I help Kenny Sanson because... He's sleeping in that park every day and every night. And I'm thinking, God, Kenny Sampson was one of this country's finest fullbacks. And uh, not just in my opinion, but in the fact that Arsenal picked him every week, England picked him every game. And all of a sudden he's gone from that to in a park looking for help. And um, Brian Robson rang me as well because he had had a call from Kenny Sampson about being in the park. And uh, Brian asked me if I could help, and I was ready to go on a train to London. I was ready to go to wherever he was in, the whatever park he was in. Then I got another message to say that he doesn't really want me to come because um, I can't help him. He's got to do it, which is 
which is right, but I could have helped him and, and just turning up and having a chat with him. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, um, whoever it is, they, they've got to do it themselves with the help of others. Um, they've got to do it themselves and make that final move to, to make sure that they want to do it. As soon as they tell you they want to do it, you can't help them. And and you, you do go and help them. But first of all, they've got to tell you they want yeah. to do it. And do you think that's always been, been your nature, like to, to help people just naturally? No, no. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was sitting at home one night thinking, what have I done? And what have I done to help somebody? And what can I do that I know I can help them? And it's only that that started me off because I knew I could, through football, I knew I could get the support of people to get a building, which was a local council. Mm. I knew I could get the support of people for food, which is all the outlets that are out there nowadays. I knew that if any of them knew me from the past, which is a football past, I knew the support. Yeah. Um, and so on trend and clothe them. I knew I could clothe them because I knew people would rally round. So I set out to do it and realized quickly that I had done what I set out to do. Um, I just, I met a bit of opposition on the way. Don't ask me why there's opposition as regards looking after homeless people, but I did meet a, a bit of opposition. And it's because of that, I said, right, not in these words, in stronger words, soft them. <laughs> um, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to continue to help the people that I've tried to help. And there's nobody going to get try. Uh, there's nobody going to get rid of me. Um, I think the objective was to try and get rid of me off the scene, off the sort of circuit of of being a number of people that help homeless people. And um, when I met that sort of resistance, I dug my heels in and decided. No, I'm, I'm going to stick around. That's fantastic, mate. And I do think you're uh, playing yourself down slightly in terms of your good nature because, um, yeah, you, you're lucky to have uh, contacts that you can call upon and obviously yeah. because of your football career and stuff like that. But there's a lot of ex-players that um, sit on their laurels and uh, enjoy the uh, finer things in life and, and the adulation of supporters and they do their odd talks and stuff like that. So... For you to be um, for you to have founded this organisation is actually making a difference, no matter how um, many people it's actually affecting. I, I do yeah. think well, there's no point talking about it. You've got to go and do it, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And and if you manage to do it, and I've managed to do what I've done, for, get the roof over their head and feed them and and whatever else, um, I'm chuffed at that. Yeah, yeah. I really, I'm chuffed. It's, in terms of comparing it to football. It's like going to Wembley and, and, and winning a cup final. You get a great deal of satisfaction out of it. And when you, and we've had people move out of here and get married and end up with a child and things like that. Um, I had a couple of lads that came here and I wrote them off. I gave them no hope. They were too much into drugs. And, but they decided, one in particular, who now drives a taxi, Muslim lad that we had in here, drives a taxi. He decided the life he was living wasn't good enough for him. He asked me to help him. We tried to help him. We did help him. And he's back on track because he decided to do it with a little bit of help from us. But without somebody deciding they want to do it, you won't get any results. So we've had a few results that, believe me, has been great. It gives, It makes you feel... It makes you feel good. Yeah. And then when you see them progressing in, into a life, it makes you feel even better. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and then I'd just like to touch on um, your managerial career as well, because I know that you actually went and managed Celtic. Um, I don't actually know how that went. Um, I haven't looked into it. What was that experience like? Was it good to go back to Celtic? And how did you do as a manager? Because I actually don't know this. So. Right, OK. Uh, the Celtic job was up for grabs. Yeah. I knew it was the wrong time to go back there. I knew it was the wrong time because any managerial decision you make, you're making it on your judgment. If you go for a job and you get it, first of all, it's your judgment to go for that particular job. I had a gut feeling Celtic job wasn't the right job for me at the time. Um, problems at the club, pro problems with players, 
Do you think there was an emotional uh, connection yes, with, 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 with Frank without Lampard, you know, at Chelsea? Frank Lampard returning to Chelsea. Um, I think there's a certain level of management where you can't... Like, I support, I support Aston Villa, and I think right. a better manager at other clubs, then it's, it's a hard balance because you're going to do your very, very best, but sometimes that yeah. uh, overspill into getting too emotional and too, in, too into the job. Yeah, before I go back to the job, you just mentioned Villa. Just to let you know, um, Jack Grealish and John McGinn have both sent me, well, an England shirt. Really? Do whatever we can with it. John McGinn with obviously a Scottish shirt. Really? Yeah, and I'd just like to say, and you, if you ever come across them, you can say it on my behalf. Thanks very much. It's been you know, a great gesture. We'll make the, the use of it. We'll get them framed. We'll probably auction them or put them up for a, a raffle prize. Yeah. Um, so right, that's the villa bit. You've had your you've had your two minute two seconds of villa. <laughs> I go back to Celtic. Knew yeah. it was the wrong job at the wrong time. Couldn't yeah. refuse it. Um, because of in management what I'd done, I got the offer of the job. No other reason, not because I was a ex Celtic player. They had no money at all. Nothing. Uh, club was going to be taken over, and it's in football. If the club's going to be taken over by a new owner, the first thing he's going to do is get rid of you. That's why I was fearful of all those things. All those things came to fruition. There was no money for me to spend on anybody. There was um, there was a new owner come in, had his own way of doing things. He didn't have any money to to go and do anything right away in terms of buying new players. So it never happened for me. Lost my job and moved back to Stoke City, where I'd come from. Yeah. So that's my Celtic career. Um, and then as a manager, I had a great... Yeah, so... Yeah, so yeah, I went back to Stoke City. Yeah, I went back to Stoke City for the second time as the, as the manager. Um, it's a club I was comfortable with. It's a club that I'd like to think most people were comfortable with me. Um, and we, we we did okay. And as a result of that, I got offered two jobs in the same week. One was West Ham. One was Chelsea. Uh, Ken Bates was in charge of Chelsea. Um, and the West Ham was a family-run club at the time. Uh, John Lyle had been at West Ham, a legend, a great guy. Um, a nice guy, a guy that every club would, would love to have as their manager. Um, and I decided to go to West Ham. I made a mistake because people like John Lyle, and who've done so much for one particular club, been there, I don't know, 16, 18, 20 years. Um, you can never equal that. So probably you're on a bit of a loser from the start. A bit like Sir Alex has proved. Anybody goes to Old Trafford, if you're trying to match his record, if you're trying to do... What, what people have seen Sir Alex do in his time as manager, yeah. you're on a loser. And no one will equal... I just did a thing the other day for Manchester United about Sir Alex, and no one. I said no one will ever equal his record in terms of wins and how he performed as a manager at Old Trafford. They've already tried. Yeah. And I think uh, there's, there's already been, what, four, maybe five casualties... Yeah, there's been, yeah. Been Van Gaal, there's been Jose, um, there's been David Moyes, yeah, uh, and uh, there's been uh, was a caretaker, but... there, caretaker, all he's there now, yeah, yeah, they can do okay, but in the memory of a lot of Manchester United supporters, not just in this country, all over the world, um, in the memory is Sir Alex Ferguson, yeah, and in the memory of everybody, I'm sure, is. What he did, his record, his number of games unbeaten, all these records will will be there for a long time. Yeah. Um, so, where do you think your best out. time was as a manager? What club? What club was was the best time that you had as a manager? The most enjoyable? Um, probably the most enjoyable because the most successful would would, would have been at Stoke. Yeah. Um, as 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 a successful manager. Um, and after that, decided, right, uh, I decided the game's changing a little bit. Um, I used to train people hard and work them hard because all my managers did the same to me. 
So and it was successful, but there was a growing trend in football of people not wanting to train so hard, not wanting to work so hard. And I think it's fair to say we're in that uh, we're certainly in that way nowadays because all I hear about is people are tired, people are training too hard. There's too many games. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I think um, Alex Ferguson uh, he said himself the other day. Um, it's completely changed management. He yeah, said that a lot yeah. of players have been known to cry upon criticism. So yeah. it's just they're different, 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 players, different gravy yeah. now. For players. Yeah, different gravy, and it was time to me get to get out of that rather than taking the view. I can still get them to work hard. I can still get them to play three games a week without complaining because it was easy for my team at Stoke because um, they had to play. They were on terrible wages because that was the way it was at the time. Yeah, they just Stoke paid them terrible wages, but everybody was on more or less the same, 170, 180, 190 pound a week, which is not going to get any of them rich and millionaires overnight. But we've turned that into a, a breed of player that gets, I don't know, so many million, so many this, so many that. Uh, they're still not happy. The lifestyle's different. Everything's different. And even the voice of the, the greatest manager ever, Sir Alex Ferguson, is going to count for nothing. Mm. So when he made that move, I thought, yeah, you are a smart manager because you've just made the move that you should move. If you don't, you'll get swallowed up in the, the yeah. modern day, which is listening to agents instead of listening to the boss. I suppose Arsene Wenger probably should have left yeah. a little bit earlier than, than he did. Without a doubt, I used to say every season, Arsene, do yourself a favour, get out. Mm. They're not listening to you. They don't want to listen to you yeah. because they've got the money, they've got everything they want, and they, they don't need a, a mentor or a, someone who's going to guide them in football to improve themselves. Those days are gone, so uh, Sir Alex is better for it. Because now we're doing what we always should do. Remember what he did. Never forget what he did. And realise, a bit like Jock Steen, Arsene Wenger you've mentioned, and lots of other great managers, that the best days at a football club are going to be under these managers. Yeah, 100%. Lou, just to um, wrap up your football career a little bit, because I'm, I'm conscious that um, the Macari Foundation is um, what the what this video is is in, to, to raise awareness of the Macari Foundation, um, obviously to give background to yourself as well. Um, but I want to get back onto the, the uh, foundation in a minute. Um, but just to round up your career, um, what would you say uh, your best moments in your career was in terms of maybe goals, achieve, like achievements? Um, um, career football-wise is yeah. the fact that you're is the fact that you're asked to play for Celtic. You start off as a kid looking after, you'll remember these lads, the Lisbon Lions, as yeah. they call them. Um, you're putting the kit out in the morning. You're taking the kit away. You're putting in the laundry. You're cleaning their kit. You're cleaning their boots. Those moments with the names that apply to the Lisbon Lions were fantastic. You never believe you got in the team because these great players are still playing. But I did get in the team. I wore the hoops of Celtic. Um, played against Rangers on a number of occasions. Played in FA, Scottish Cup finals rather. Played in FA Cup finals at Wembley. Those feelings of being in that um, tunnel before a game, I can still remember what it's like. And then walking out on the pitch at Hamden Park with 138,000 people. Wow. Wembley with 100,000 people. The Wembley Tunnel was a big, long tunnel that as you walked up it, you got closer to the playing surface. And the closer you got to the playing surface, the louder the roar of the crowd got. Again, uh, memories, great memories that people nowadays with plenty of money I'm sure would pay anything to experience that. They'll never, because they can't play football. But yeah. people with plenty of money would love to experience what I was fortunate enough to experience. Went to a World Cup. Argentina. Argentina. I can't remember a better player than me called George Best. I can't remember him going to a World Cup. 
<laughs> and I remember Sir Bobby being involved in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dennis Law. Um, I went to Old Trafford and it lasted, and I can proudly say that, lasted 11 years. A lot of people don't last 11 years. Um, played the games that I played, 401 games and 99 goals. Um, managed under the managers that I talked about, which was... I look back and I think these were great guys. These were proper human beings. Um, and I couldn't, I don't think I could have asked for, and you only realise this at the end of your career. You don't realise it while you're playing. You don't realise it when you just finish. But at the end of your career, when you're looking back, you do realise that what you've achieved has been has been pretty pretty good, to say the least. One um, of them. I, I don't think I could have done better as a player, and um, loved every minute of, of it, and... Um, apart from um, apart from managing Blues? Apart, no, manage Blues, right? <laughs> Here you go, you've got your yeah. Villa hat on now, yeah, yeah. because you'll know this, there was a, there was a set, certain section of the crowd at Blues called the Zulu Warriors. Zulu Warriors, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah One-eyed there. Baz. One-eyed Baz. One-eyed bars or two-eyed bars, whatever, yeah, or yeah. three-eyed bars. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when you've got that following behind you, because I did take Blues to Wembley. Did you? I, yeah, I did. I took Blues to Wembley and I managed them, got the job, and six months later we're, we're at Wembley in one of the, the competitions that for the lower division teams. Yeah. I was chuffed at that. I thought, if I can win this trophy for Blues, it's going to be great because... They hadn't won anything. They weren't going to win anything apart from a cup down near the bottom of the league. Got got the job. Didn't wasn't given a contract because the owners had no money. Took the contract on an agreement. If we did anything, I'll get a contract. Yeah. I'll get uh, I'll get rewarded for it. Took the Blues there. Won it. Didn't get rewarded for it, and I walked out on them. I'm not ashamed to say I walked out on them because I was promised if I did do anything for them. And that's all I was promised. Yeah. So that's all uh, I was looking to get a contract on. The fact that we'd win something, went there, won something, and didn't get the reward that I should have got for for winning it. Did you ever play Villa as a as a Blues manager? Uh, no, no, no. Different. But I went. I took Stoke City to Villa Park. What was that like? Gordon Cowan's testimonial. Oh, uh, really? Right. Yeah. And on the night, we had a great night. Gordon got a decent crowd there. I brought 4,000 Stoke supporters who paid tribute to Gordon Cowens. Fair play to them. And um, if you ever watch a, a video or a film called Marvellous... I, I know, yeah, I've, se I've seen it. I've seen it right. about the Kitman. About uh, Kitman, Kitman played at Villa Park. And my really? Kitman, he missed a sitter. He missed <laughs> a golden opportunity. Which I, I never, ever forgave him for it. And... Um, it was a chance for him to make his name at Villa Park yeah. in front of the crowd, and he yeah. blew it. Jesus. Uh, well, yeah. I suppose that sums up the kit then, doesn't it? I'll be ringing him after this programme to yeah. tell him I've exposed them to the whole world <laughs> about missing a sitter at Villa Park. I think there's a video of it. There would be a video. <laughs> he remembers it. Yeah. Um, so, we've... Um, uh, Wait, we've Covered most most things. I found the kit man. He came to looking for a job. I gave him a job because, again, I just had a gut feeling about him. You know, you, lots of things you do in football. I did in football. So I had a gut feeling, and I had a gut feeling that with him helping us, circus clown he was, as you you'll probably remember. Yeah, from the film. Uh, yeah. Yeah, helped us in the dressing room. Helped us everywhere just because he was funny. So yeah. I had a party playing my team. I like, I like a bit of a laugh and a joke. Yeah. Um, and he told me that we'd win a video. We'd win a video. We'd win an Oscar or a BAFTA for... We'd win a BAFTA for going to... For creating this um, this film. And he was right. We went to Theatre Royal in Drury Lane and... Was it his and, idea to make the film? Um, the, the, guy, uh, the guy who eventually did make the film you know, asked me... Would I tell him all the things we'd done together? And because he wanted to make a film of of the circus clown and his circus days, and then into Stoke, 
and then how it can happen a bit like what we'd ha- like to happen to homeless people, that what can happen with just somebody uh, who's been sacked, looking for a job, gets a job, makes the best of it, goes back into life and more or less gets back to the top when it all looked lost in terms of uh, his career, took him on at Stoke and it worked. Underdog yeah. for it. It worked as well, and we won a BAFTA for it. Yeah, when yeah, brilliant. It was, uh, it's rated 7.9 on IMBD. Uh, uh, yeah, so for people that, that's a real, that's a really high rating for a film. Right. That's Good. a very high rating, like 7.9. Um, and it's a good film as well. I've watched it. So anyone watching, I'd, I'd definitely say give it a watch. Good, thanks. It's, it's good. Um, how, how involved were you in the film process? Were you on set and were you like, I was on set. I was. I had to supply all the all the pieces of information about what we did. Yeah. Why I put him in a chicken outfit in the first day of his of his job. Yeah. I took him up to the the thing they installed the uh, costume shop in Stoke, and I said, "Can you fit this man out in something?" And we fitted him out in a chicken outfit uh, with a big beak and everything, and yeah. introduced him to all the players with the chicken head on. Yeah. With the beak, um, as a new kit manager, and they were all saying things like, um, is it okay if I swear here? Yes, of course, you can go for it, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were saying things like, what the fuck's going on? This was in the dressing room <laughs> on his first day. Who's this fucking, fucking imposter? Things like that. Because <laughs> we hadn't taken the chicken head off. Told him, had, you told, had you told them he was the new kit man? Or did you I just told him he was the new kit manager. <laughs> Um, I told him he was coming to, to give us a big lift. I then told him he was a circus clown. So by that time, they were confused. Yeah, I bet, yeah, yeah, yeah. The kit man who was a circus clown, the guy in front of them, there's a chicken outfit on with a big head on, and um, eventually took the head off, and my man, my pal, my great pal, Nella, was standing there in front of them, and immediately, when they saw him, uh, they saw what I saw. They saw a character. They saw somebody who was, hopefully in their eyes, was going to be funny. And the camaraderie between him and them was great. Mm. It was fantastic. And it proved not only and could you get somebody like that to help you at a football club, it proved that there are people who are down in the luck, can bounce back, and it proved that he would, he he could do that and help them in the dressing room, especially feel a little bit more relaxed than than they may be because yeah, most of the time he was in a costume, most of the time he was laughing and joking. Yeah, um, it's a smart but, move from yourself because the kit man is that that's the role where they don't have to have any discipline and. Uh, Element. Correctly. And let me tell you, <laughs> yeah. let me assure you, there was no discipline in the dressing room. It yeah. was chaos. Yeah. It was chaos. And that leads me on to the best day we had was we're playing Tranmere at Tranmere. He had his uh, kit on. Yeah. Um, and in the dressing room, and here's another link. Oh, God. It's the Villa link as well. Um Centre forward, you'll need to help me out now. He's, I've just lost his name. Uh, Tony Whip. No, no, centre forward for Villa. What time? Um, no. Give me a thought, an era. Give me a. This is the 90s. The 90s. Tony D- Daly. No. I'll get help before the end of the programme. Yeah. But Ed, <laughs> he said yeah. in the dressing room, he was boasting. About he'd been to Manchester. Don't forget, we're going back to the nineties now. Yeah, we're going back. He's boasting about he had a pair of underpants that he bought in Kendall's in Manchester that cost him eighty quid. Right. right. So this was the talk of the dressing room that uh, he's got these underpants, 90, 80, 90 quid, and it was at a time when underpants that we all had were a fiver. Yeah. That was the bunch <laughs> had. yeah. So the banter in the dressing room was about, oh, this and that, and we're paying you too much. So anyway, they went out for the warm up, come back in, 
and then eventually they went out for the game. So I said to Neil, do us a favour, Neil, get his 90-pound pair of underpants on underneath your tracksuit. The big guy, Neil, sweated a lot, trumped a lot, farted a lot, everything that he did. Yeah. Uh, he used to eat meat pies in the back of the dugout and then <laughs> trumping along for almost 90 minutes. And... Um, I said, when they go out, get his underpants on, right next to your, obviously, your skin. Yeah. And keep them on for the whole 90 minutes. And when we come in, we'll do a bit of a strip tease in the dressing room. And um, this will work, I said to him. Yeah. Can I, can I just leave you and I'll go and get his name? I hate not remembering his name. Go for it, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go for it, yeah. No, no. Hey, I shouldn't have forgot Martin Carruthers. Oh, uh, Martin Carruthers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's Martin Carruthers' his underpants. We're at Villa, we're at uh, Tranmere Rovers, early yeah. kickoff, because Liverpool are playing just down the road at three o'clock. And um, Martin Carruthers has got the underpants, starts posting about them. Uh, so Neil's now got them on for the whole game. But before we went down the tunnel to the dugout, I told him to get everybody's underpants on. Yeah. So he had 13 pair of underpants on, and he looked like the Michelin man. You know that big yeah. Michelin man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sat, in the back, he sat in the dugout the whole game, trumping, farting, doing everything. He'd meat pies, he'd gravy, the lot. And just by coincidence, Martin Carruthers scores the winning goal. He's oh. had a bit of a bashing before the game yeah. about the plans, but he scores the winning goal. So we get in the dressing room, everybody slap one of those hands, all get in the bath, right? The lot of them. And um, first person out the bath, again, a coincidence, Martin Carruthers. Yeah. What's the first thing you do? What's the first thing you put on? Your underpants. Yeah, yeah. He's underpants on and he says, some bastards nick my underpants. <laughs> Right, so they're all geeing them up about it. Yeah, and then one by one, all the players are coming out of the bath, and they're all going for their underpants. And one by one, they're all saying, "Some bastards nick my <laughs> underpants." So I said to Neil, "Get in the toilet. Yeah, come out, strip off the thirteen pair of underpants like a stripper, throwing them up in the air." Yeah, yeah. Right. So he goes <laughs> in, gets his tracksuit bottoms off, comes out, dressing room full of players cussing and screaming about scousers of Nickma underpants. The YT players are getting accused of it. And yeah. he comes out with these underpants on. Starts doing the strip strip tees, which they're all liking, and yeah. he's throwing them all over the place. And Carruthers said before, after about six have been taken off, Carruthers says, my fucking underpants better not be where <laughs> yeah. I think they might be. <laughs> Yeah. And of course, he gets down to the last, the last <laughs> pair of underpants. I bet he never, I bet he never wore, I bet he never wore them again. Straight in the bin. Straight in the bin. <laughs> Straight in the bin. Yeah. I was going to put it in the bin. Yeah, but, yeah. You know that was that was the type of team spirit we have, due to him yeah. really do, doing anything for me. Yeah. He'd do anything for me. Anything to ask. Yeah. So we built up a team spirit. And it worked, and it was a circus clown, and it, it's proved another thing in life that uh, you can get people in with other assets rather than football um, knowledge, football jargon, football ability, and they can help you as well. And he, he did it for us. I'm going to watch that film again later. Now that we've, uh, you'll see a little, you'll see the clip, but it, it'll be at the training ground. Yeah. So is it different, slightly different in the film to it was in yeah, the... Yeah, it's different in the film yeah. to what it was 
on the day because yeah. it was actually a game. And yeah. Of course, we couldn't get access to a game and be in the dressing room and, and yeah, do exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But my, but like your life has really been a bit of a movie. Like you've you've played for Man United over four hundred yeah. times. Um, correct me again. Ninety nine goals. Is it ninety nine? Yeah, ninety nine goals. Yeah. goals. You've played for your boyhood club, Celtic. You've managed yeah. Celtic. Um, you've um, not appeared in a film, but you've your uh, you've been played in a film, um, yeah. and now you've come come to a part in your life where. Oh no! So I've been in the film. I, I was in the film. Oh, were you in the film? Yeah, I was in the oh, film. Were well, you in the film? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, we, right. we shot at a crew, Alexander. Some yeah. of it there, some of it at Wrexham, and um, yeah, crew and Wrexham was the main places we did it. Yeah, because yeah, I saw it on yeah. TV. Um, it was a few years ago. It was on. Um, they showed it on TV. It's on I YouTube watched. at the moment. Yeah, I'll give it. I'll yeah. watch that again then. Yeah. The whole guy, time. the guy who played me, was in the film um, Three Hundred. Is it? The, the, so, so, so yeah, that's what I meant. So you you were playing. I played. I played me in the film along with, along with Tony Curran, his name is playing right. me as well. All oh, right, okay. So I'm in the film. I'm in the dugout at Villa Park. Yeah. With Tony Curran. Yeah. I'm in other. I'm doing other things in the film, but then Tony Curran plays me and he does things. Yeah. Um, as well. So you can add movie star as well. He's, well, he actually lives in Los Angeles. He's Scottish. Yeah. He turned up the crew. I'd never met him before. Yeah. He opened my cabin door. He had red hair down to here. <laughs> yeah. He was nearly, well, he was probably about 5'10", and I'm 5'6". Yeah. And he said in his Scottish accent, I'm playing you. <laughs> You're not okay. I looked and I thought, right. <laughs> get a haircut first, uh, get a haircut. So he got a haircut. Yeah. He'd have he, to. Got he had learned through listening to me on television, doing punditry and doing talk sport that I worked for at the time. Yeah. He had tried to, you know, grasp the 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 Scottish Glasgow accent. Yeah. And um, and he he was brilliant. He was a Celtic supporter. Followed my career, so he knew he knew my career. Yeah, um, and he was he, he was he was brilliant. He 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 did it. Yeah, he did it better, obviously better than I could anyway. But he he was fantastic. Tony was. So Lou, now at um at this part of your life, um, we've just gone over everything that's preceded it. Um, and it's been legendary. Not many people can say that they've scored that many goals in front of uh, the Stretford End, Old Trafford. Not many people can say that they've represented their boyhood club, playing for them and managing and managing them. Yeah. Um, not many people can say that they've been in a movie. Yeah. Now, now what's what's the what's the goals <laughs> now going forward? Is um, it concentrating on the foundation? Is it is that what? Well, I'm talking to you at this moment from the Macari Centre in, in Hanley. Um, um, in the last two weeks have been, and I don't don't ask me why it's been the last two weeks, but the last two weeks have been hectic, to say the least. Yeah. Probably every newspaper in, in this country here to do something. Uh, we've had radio, we've had uh, ITV news, we've had BBC news. We were, we were all those people here. We've had recognition from FIFA. Now, FIFA, as you know, the football's world governing body, they're in Switzerland. Mm. We're in Stoke-on-Trent. There's no reason why they should have any knowledge of us, but they have. Yeah. Uh, we've been in their magazine. We've been on their website. Is this, um, do you think it's the pods, the, the idea that's quite an innovative idea? Do you think that's what's caught the attention? Of uh, no, um, well, Marcus, Marcus, uh, you know, uh, Marcus, Marcus, at Old, Marcus at Old Trafford, um, he's come to life and, and done something which is, which is brilliant. And people have probably taken the view, well, he's no need to do that. Um, and he's done it and he's been, he's been successful in doing it. 
which is the biggest thing of all. And I would just probably like to think the same people have seen what I've been doing. People have taken note of well governing body in football. Of of uh, they've taken notice of it, and um, we've achieved what I what I set out to achieve, which is to feed people and clothe them. That Marcus has achieved what he's set out to achieve, which is put food on the table for young children. Yeah, and um, I think maybe it's just as simple as that. That yeah. football football for a number of years has just been uh, has played no great part in in helping less fortunate people. Um, because I know a lot of ex-footballers. I know a successful team of uh, Stoke players that, that went to Wembley in 1972 and won the Cup, come back with that Cup. And and, and, and I see them nowadays, because I meet up with them quite often, and I see them nowadays with with nothing. Yeah. And, you know, football can always do a lot more for people I think Marcus Rashford, um, like what he's done is is incredible, and it's kind of like set the path for other footballers. That shows that you don't have to just um, be bland. You don't have to just go along with club um, communications no. and stuff. You can take your own platform and and yeah. really make a difference with Parliament and and in politics. Because at the end of the day, football is the most popular sport in the country. So without a doubt, and, and it's helped me, it's helped me get to where I am today. Yeah. Um, which is at the McCarry Centre in Hanley, looking after 46 people. We've been going for four years. If I hadn't been involved in football, that would never have happened. That mm. would never have started. But first of all, I got in on the back of football through the city council looking for a looking for premises from them, and uh, got the premises, and then brought in the food, brought in the clothing. Um, through the generosity of people in Stoke on Trent. I say Stoke on Trent, I should enlarge that and say in surrounding areas now all over the world. We're, we're talking about Switzerland. Yeah. I've got Spanish television coming next week um, to film the centre. And again, that hasn't come just because I've got the centre. That's come because I've been an ex-footballer. Yeah. And and I've played. I didn't know, Lou, to be honest, to be to be honest with you, I didn't know um, when I, cause I, I was uh, searching for charities to do a video on, um, and I came ac uh, across the Macari Foundation, um, and I'm only I'm 22, yeah. um, so I know my football, but I, like your era, um, I don't know that many players, but I didn't click him. The, the name Lou Macari now clicks, but at the time I just saw the Macari Foundation. I spoke, yeah. to, I spoke to you on the phone and it just didn't click. I don't think it, I even, you said your name was Lou, but it, it didn't click. And then I Googled you and then I found out that you, your whole background before that. So yeah, um, there was no reason why it should click with you. You're from a different time. Yeah, I'm from a different era. Yeah. So, but yeah. um yeah, it's quite incredible. And and the way that you're saying you're having all these different interviews from Spanish TVs and all this all this stuff, um, I feel really grateful that you've given me the time because obviously I'm nothing big at the moment. Um, I'm just starting off. Um, but I do want to give a bit of a kind of a bit of if anyone does watch it, just a bit of yeah. um, pub, pub, publicity for uh, the yeah. That's nice. Yeah, you you're going to make your own way in life, and you you're going to be successful. I can tell. It's just um, it's like Neil when I met him outside Stoke. Just something I uh, I got a feeling. Um, yeah. Hopefully, if I'm still around and you're still around, yeah. ten years from now, you can ring me up and say it's me, yeah. that guy you did an interview for. Yeah. I say to some of these in here, and I say it jokingly sometimes, um, uh, some of our guests in here, the homeless people, that um, that um, uh, stick around, you might end up in Hollywood. <laughs> I don't believe I'm ever going to Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I tend to say that because of what's happened to me with Neil. What's yeah, happened? you really got there. You, well, you, you basically <laughs> did, so, you know. Say I'll take you. To, that's what I said. I'll take you to Hollywood, pal. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. I'll take you to Hollywood, pal. 
Aim for, the, aim for the stars and you might just get to the... Uh, yeah, you may do. The edge of the earth or whatever. And I've met up with somebody, funny enough, talking about Hollywood, I've yeah. met up with somebody who may, may become one of our trustees. Yeah. Rachel Shenton. I don't know if you, you know the name, but she's from Stoke. She went to America last year and won an Oscar. I think I've seen her on your website. There was a lady... Um, that I recognised. Yeah, I do know her. Yeah. She's, a, she's in, at the moment, she's in All Creatures Great and Small. And yeah. That's the name of the Sunday night. It's, it's on ITV. Yeah, um, yeah. I recognise, I've seen her in, she's been she was in, she was in Hollyoaks. That's she where she was. Hollyoaks, yeah. Hollyoaks, yeah. She yeah. went to America and, you know, won an Oscar and beat off American opposition, which yeah. doesn't happen. Certainly doesn't happen for people in Stoke on Trent. So yeah. as soon as I seen her do that, I thought, bloody hell, Rachel, uh, you, you're a winner. And she is yeah. a winner. Lovely girl. Her, her 20, 30 minute short film was about deafness because Def she had people in her family that were deaf and it was about deaf people. Okay, and she yeah. went, got the trophy, beat all the Americans in Los Angeles in that big event they have where, yeah. you've, got, where you've got the red carpet and all that carry on. Yeah. And she did. So she's part of us and helps us out from time to time. And I'm just trying to bring her on board in, the, in a more important role. You don't need to hustle. <laughs> well, you're doing journalism. You do need All to right. hustle. Um, you, need to, you, need to, you need to get people to interview, just find contacts. Um, so it is about hustling. It's about speaking to people and just emailing people. And um, I mean, you are by far the most... Um, a decorated person that I've done a video with so far. Uh, I, I did one with Ethan Mannion to play for Man City Ladies from the FA Cup. Um, she currently plays as a professional for Man City like, for Ladies. Uh, I've done a few athletes and stuff like that. Um, but I'm just yeah, I'm just starting off here, so I really I really appreciate the time. Yeah, I'll go back just before we finish. There, I'll just go back to the help that you need to yeah. be successful. I've had a lot of help. Had somebody come and write, write me out a cheque at Christmas for five thousand pound. I'd never seen him before. I saw I'm that. Probably, on the, yeah, I saw that on the website. Yeah. Probably never see him again. If you can readjust your camera, because I I'm not good at these Zoom things. But behind me is a load of cheques all around our room from Stoke City. If you, yeah. I don't know if you can sort of adjust your camera to catch these cheques that are up here. See the Stoke City badge, but you'd have to you'd have to move your camera. But all right, sorry, I need to move mine. Oh, there, there you go. go. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so these, cool. yeah. these are sleep outs that Stoke yeah. City have arranged for us, where yeah. people come and do what homeless people do for most of the of their life. Yeah, which sleep out rough. You do it for one night. The experience is horrendous. I'll just get out of the way. You can see the cheques there. There's others around the room um yeah i can see them um, also people people choose to sleep out rough for the night yeah uh and make a donation like or a charge to five pound or ten pound yeah. and yeah. these are the amounts of money the stoke of race ten thousand pound eight thousand nine hundred one thousand sixteen thousand up here above us brilliant and that's that's an experience for the public. I've done it. We've done it for the last five years. I did it once. I've got a picture of you um, outside, I think, the Stoke ground with a dog. Was that well, that's it. Did? That's my dog, Buddy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd never do it again. Yeah. It's a horrendous experience, and that's just one night. Mm. Yeah. Now, for people that we've got in here to have been doing it all their lives, it's an achievement. Not an achievement they'll be proud of or want to be proud of, but I can assure them that having experienced it for the one night, there's something about them, they're gritty, they're stubborn, um, whatever other words you want to describe them, that that is it, because it took me five days to recover. I went home next morning, eight o'clock in the morning, got in my bed, felt terrible. I'd been sleeping out, it was cold bitterly cold. It was on a concrete floor in the concourse in the stadium. Yeah. 
Um, so that's the public, though. The public have helped us get there. The public yeah. have responded. And without the public, we would we still we'd have done something, but we wouldn't have been as successful as we have been. Yeah. And I think that goes for every charity, doesn't it? You need to rely on on yeah. on, public, on on the public's generosity. Um yeah. I'll, I'll tag in uh, the foundation um in the video, Lou. So um if anyone wants to make any donations, can you do it on the website? Is that how you get can you do donations through the website? Uh, we 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 yeah we do our donations. We don't make a big deal out of them, but we have yeah on the website it tells tells you where to go. Yeah. Um, and have you got um have you got a Facebook page or anything that we have got a Facebook page. Got to be I'll, honest, I'm not I'll on able, Facebook. Yeah, I'll, in, I'll, I'll, I'll be able. To, is it? Is, I'll, I'll be able to find it. It will be under um. I like Twitter. I'm on there. Oh yeah, do you like Twitter? <laughs> yeah. No, just. I, I can use it. Like, I shouldn't say yeah. I like it. I can use it easier than, yeah. than anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, we're going to uh, wrap it up, Lou, anyway. Um, again, your life literally has been a bit of a movie, a bit of a movie. Manchester United legend, Celtic legend, um, and now towards the end of your life, you're trying to make a difference with uh, people that need it. So uh, massive respect to you, Lou. And uh, thanks Good for the chat, mate. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Cheers, Lou. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, bro. Cheers. Thank you.